On May 25, 1807, a settler named John Boyer was killed near Urbana. There were rumors that Tecumseh and other Native Americans with him had done this. Tecumseh and the Native Americans were innocent. On June 24, Tecumseh, accompanied by about five or six chiefs and about 60 warriors, met with a large number of settlers who included Simon Kenton in Springfield. The council met near Main and Spring Streets in a grove of maple trees near Griffith Foo's Tavern. After some tense moments and discussions back and forth, it was determined that Tecumseh and his men were not guilty. After the council, Tecumseh and the Native Americans remained in Springfield for a few days. The settlers and the Shawnee participated in friendly athletic contests. These included running, throwing, jumping, wrestling. Tecumseh amazed everyone with his strength and athletic skill. There was no more trouble with the Shawnee in Springfield, even though Tecumseh and his brother, the Prophet, still wanted to fight the white men. In 1812, war began between the United States and England. Tecumseh used this war to try to defeat the United States. He united the Native American tribes and joined the British Army at the Battle of the Thames on October 5, 1813. In this battle, Tecumseh was killed. Simon Kenton was present with the American Army as a guide and a scout. According to legend, Kenton saw Tecumseh die and was asked by the Americans to identify Tecumseh's body. Kenton led the American soldiers away from Tecumseh's body so the chief would not be dishonored. The Shawnee later came and buried Tecumseh in secret. To this day, the location of Tecumseh's grave is unknown. Robert Rennix, or Rennick, was a man who owned, along with James Dement, part of Springfield known as the West End. Dement had built a grist mill and a still in 1803 along Buck Creek. In 1804, there were 11 log cabins in Springfield, and the village was divided into two parts by a creek called Mill Run. The people on both sides of Mill Run decided they needed a man to take care of the mail. So, Mr. Rennix was named the first postmaster of Springfield. He was also a justice of the peace. The Smallwood family came to Springfield from Virginia in 1804. As soon as they were settled, Mr. Smallwood opened the first blacksmith shop. He was the only blacksmith in Springfield for many years. Mrs. Smallwood was a brilliant and refined lady. She was interested in improving the community of Springfield. There was no church or house of worship in Springfield at the time, so Mrs. Smallwood started having services in her home. She is recognized as the first active Methodist in the city. Mrs. Smallwood described Springfield as she saw it in 1804. The town consisted of 11 log cabins, mentioned earlier, John Reed's Cooper or Barrel Making Shop, Charles Stowe's Dry Goods and Grocery Store, another dry goods store, and two taverns. Since there was no church in the town, traveling Methodist and Baptist ministers held services in Foose Tavern or outdoors if weather permitted. In 1806, Nathaniel Pinkard opened a school on the corner of Main and Market Streets. Church services were moved from Foos Tavern to Mr. Pinkard's school. Mr. Pearson Spining and his wife, Mary Schooley Spining, moved to the Springfield area in 1812. Mr. Spining's father had stores in Hamilton, Ohio, and in Dayton, Ohio. He bought goods in the east for the stores. When the goods arrived in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, they were loaded on flatboats and floated down the Ohio River to Cincinnati. The goods were then loaded onto wagons and brought to the stores in Hamilton and Dayton. When Mr. Spining came to Springfield, he set up a store here. He sold dry goods, groceries, and iron stoves. He bought a large amount of land, and when the National Road was being constructed through Clark County, Mr. Spining was the chief contractor. Mr. Spining also brought the first piano to Clark County. It was a gift for his wife and his daughter. People came from miles around to see and hear the piano being played. You can still see this very same piano on display at the Heritage Center of Clark County. It is part of the collection of the Clark County Historical Society. Construction on the National Road began in 1811 in Cumberland, Maryland. 
President Thomas Jefferson had authorized the National Road in 1806. This was the first federally funded interstate highway. It would run from east to west, and the road was hard to build. The road through Springfield was constructed using the macadam system. The bed of the road was raised above ground level to allow for water to drain off and to slow erosion. Then several layers of different sizes of crushed stone were laid down and pushed down, creating a solid road surface. Each stone in one layer had to be about two inches in diameter. The layers were about six to ten inches deep. When the completed National Road reached Springfield in the mid-1830s, construction stopped. Not long before this, the United States government turned over construction and control of the new road to the states. This was due to President Andrew Jackson stopping the funding for the road. The road was the main route for those who wished to settle the West, and at one point it brought between 75 and 100 stagecoaches and wagons to Springfield every day. When construction on the road stopped, Springfield became known as the town at the end of the pike. A pike is a road you pay to ride on for commercial use, but it's free for private citizens. Construction on the road began again and eventually reached Vandalia, Illinois, around 1839. Springfield continued to grow and expand as more settlers arrived. Springfield became a great hotel town because many settlers stayed here at the end of the National Road while they decided on their next move. By 1824, there were about 50 African Americans living in Springfield. The African Methodist Episcopal Church was established in Springfield that same year. During the middle of the 19th century, many factories were built in Springfield. In 1840, Mr. James Leffel built a foundry, a factory that makes items out of iron, on Buck Creek, just west of town. The mill race was a man-made water channel that ran one and a half miles and joined Buck Creek at the North Limestone Street Bridge. This stream provided the power force for many water wheels that powered the factories along the mill race. A cotton mill, three woolen mills, an oil mill, Two flour mills, two sawmills, and other factories were set up along the mill race. Even when the steam engine was developed, the factories continued to use water wheels because they were getting so much power from them. In 1862, Mr. Leffel invented the double turbine water wheel that enabled factories to make more power from the same amount of water. Until 1877, the mill run was open and often flooded. As the factories of Springfield continued to develop and change, so did the population. In 1852, the city directory listed 42 African Americans, or persons of color, as they were listed back then, who were the head of the household or in business for themselves. Among those listed were laborers, barbers, farmers, painters, blacksmiths, a cook, a preacher, a dressmaker, and a washerwoman. 